Good afternoon, and welcome to Side by Side by Side 1994. We begin this afternoon's performance with a tribute to a collaboration and the resulting musical that was to become a landmark in the evolution of musical theater. The nine musicals, which were to be created by the partnership of Richard Rodgers and Oscar Hammerstein, would forever change the course of musical theater, and to this day still influence the creation and performance of musicals, as Andrew Lloyd Webber himself has been quick to point out. What is now a musical history, 50 years ago, was innovation. With the first musical together, Rodgers and Hammerstein broke tradition and convention every step of the way. Following the overture you just heard, audiences awaited the predictable chorus number, and with a show entitled Oklahoma, they of course assumed they'd see a barn dance. They were wrong. When the curtain went up at the St. James Theater on March 31st, 1943, a lone woman was seen churning butter, and from off stage, the voice of a young Alfred Drake was heard. The lyrics he sang were not only effective in beginning the show, but were also prophetic in announcing the dawn of a new era in American music. Kansas City on a Friday By Saturday I learned a thing or two For up to then I didn't have an idea Of what the modern world was coming to I counted 20 gas buggies going by themselves Almost every time I took a walk Then I put my ear to a bell telephone And a strange woman started in to talk what next? Yeah, what? What's next? Everything's up to date in Kansas City. They've gone about as far as they can go. They went and built a skyscraper seven stories high, about as high as a building ought to grow. Everything's like a dream in Kansas City. It's better than a magic lantern show. With every kind of comfort, every house is all complete. You can walk to privies in the rain and never wet your feet. They've gone about as far as they can go. Yes, sir. They 
A few years back, at an American Choral Directors Association convention in Chicago, our director, Mr. Spaulding, bristled when the ACDA president said in his speech that the reason for music is to educate. Cap disagrees, as do we. We in Venner believe that the reason for music is to share. With that ability, music then has the power to facilitate, to celebrate, and to educate. We hope to do all three tonight. In performing our selections from Oklahoma, we learned about musical theater and history. We also added to our vocabulary such words as privy and isinglass. Many of us also attended the classic musical last fall at Saginaw's Heritage Theater. Two years ago, our director was noticeably upset when he found out that few of us knew who Yoel Brenner was. Believe me, he corrected that situation. In fact, he even rented the Temple Theater in Saginaw so that we might see the Rodgers and Hammerstein classic, The King and I, on the big screen. If any Venner cast members ever complains of becoming bored or tired in our dinner theater preparation, Cap is quick to remind us of Mr. Brenner, who played the role of a Siamese monarch some 4,625 times over a period of 30 years. Music, you see, also has the ability to inspire. The Venner ladies will now offer a duo of tunes with a dream theme, Out of My Dreams from Oklahoma, and I Have Dreamed from The King and I. A dream is coming true for many of us Venner cast members this summer, as both Venner and Circle will be performing in Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida. I mention this now, as the next song the Venner men will offer is from a Disney production. Penned by Jack Feldman and Alan Menken of Beauty and the Beast fame, the score and plot of the Disney movie Newsies was centered around a group of newsboys in New York around the turn of the century. In those days, newspaper giants such as William Randolph Hearst 
and Joseph Pulitzer were more powerful than any politician. A group of young boys, however, taught those paper monarchs that the power of the people was still greater than the power of the press. In a reaction to unreasonably low wages and worse working conditions, the newsboys decided to go on strike, to take their fate into their own hands, to seize the day. Before Rodgers and Hammerstein, before Cole Porter, and before George Gershwin, America and Broadway had Irving Berlin. The prolific musician preferred to be called a songwriter rather than a composer, and what songs he gave us. Happy Holidays, Easter Parade, This is the Army, Mr. Jones, There's No Business Like Show Business, I Want to Go Back to Michigan, Oh How I Hate to Get Up in the Morning, What'll I Do, I Love a Piano, and of course, Alexander's Ragtime Band. In 1918, Mr. Berlin composed a song for the hit review, Yip 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 Hank, but for some reason it wasn't used. In fact, it wasn't even heard until a young Kate Smith introduced to a country on the brink of World War II the great anthem, God Bless America. After Rodgers and Hammerstein, after Cole Porter, and after George Gershwin, America and Broadway still had Irving Berlin. The originator of over 800 songs, Mr. Berlin died on September 22, 1989. He was 101 years old. The performers to Mr. Berlin's tunes were as varied as they were numerous, and they spanned not only decades but generations. Bing Crosby, Fred Astaire, Danny Kaye, Rosemary Clooney, Judy Garland, all were among the hundreds having their chances with this great musician's music. Oh. And there was one more, a short singer with a tall voice. In 1946, Rodgers and Hammerstein asked Mr. Berlin to compose a show for her, and he did. 
the show was Annie Get Your Gun. But in 1950, she reintroduced herself to Broadway and to America as the hostess with the mostest on the ball. The show, Call Me Madam. The star, of course, Ethel Merman. Circle's next song, You're Just In Love. In addition to having the power to educate, to inspire, to share, and to facilitate, music also has the power to expose injustice. The 1947 musical, Finian's Rainbow, was a lighthearted tale about crocs of gold, rainbows, leprechauns, love, and Fort Knox. In a subplot of the show, though, a bigoted senator gets an education in prejudice when turned by one of the three pot of gold wishes into a black man. The end of the show sees everyone understanding that riches are found not in gold, but rather in people trusting one another. This is rather ironic for us right now, since the language we'll use to present our next song from Finian's Rainbow is one which, for far too long, inspired prejudice and mistrust. Those who use the language, often referred to as pigeon English, were called dumb. Funny, isn't it, that those ignorant enough to cling to prejudice frequently label others as dumb. In introducing our rainbow theme selections, we'll present songs from The Rainbow Connection and Finian's Rainbow by dancing with our hands. In other words, we'll use the now respected and embraced ASL 
the American Sign Language. But only illusions And rainbows have nothing to hide Someday we'll find it The rainbow connection The lovers The dreamers And me
The film featured 9,200 actors, 3,210 costume designs, 8,428 separate makeup designs, 68 sets, and a group of 150 singing midget munchkins. Despite all that, the most memorable moment in the movie, The Wizard of Oz, was when Dorothy sang a solo in the backyard of her farm. MGM had tried to get Shirley Temple for the role, but instead settled for a little-known 17-year-old actress. Though hundreds of performers have interpreted the song Over the Rainbow throughout the years, it will forever belong to the magic of the 1939 movie and the memory of its young lead, Judy Garland. Could you tell me by clapping your hands, please, how many of you attended our dinner theater performance last year? <laughs> Great. Hopefully, you'll remember we did a medley from the Broadway musical hit, The Secret Garden. Those of us who went on the VFA trip down to the Fisher Theater to see The Secret Garden, though, realized that not all songs were included in the medley we performed. One exception of note is the song we're using to close Act One. Let me ask another question, and again ask you to respond by clapping. How many of you are glad to see the Michigan winter of 1994 is now history? <laughs> well, you will then appreciate the intent of the last three songs of our first act. In singing about rainbows, we hope we've gotten you to think more of sun and rain rather than snow and sleet. Our last song, then, is hopefully undeniably prophetic when we sing that winter's on the wing.
will follow him, follow him wherever he may go. There is such an ocean too deep, a mountain so high you can keep. If you're unfamiliar with the last set of songs, that means you've most likely not seen the 1993 hit movie Sister Act, which starred Whoopi Goldberg. My advice then is to rent the VCR. Where else can you get a combination of real life, represented by Goldberg's character, wrestling traditional religion, represented by the character of classic and classy Maggie Smith, and have the two combining to triumph over evil and adversity, overcome the villains, and enjoy a happy ending, which, by the way, was capped by a visit from the Pope. We've spoken tonight about the power and lessons contained in music. Another such lesson was expressed by Harry Chapin in his song Circles, which considers all the life circles we encounter that initially take us apart, but inevitably bring us back together. Our next song completes another circle. We've spoken tonight about Rodgers and Hammerstein, who later worked with Irving Berlin, 
who wrote songs performed by Judy Garland, who also sang in The Wizard of Oz. And thinking about that classic 1939 film, I would imagine that many of you were reminded of The Cowardly Lion, portrayed by Bert Lahr, or The Tin Man, portrayed by Jack Haley, or The Wicked Witch, personified by Margaret Hamilton. No memory of that movie, however, would be complete without including the actor behind the straw and the scarecrow, Ray Bolger, who now takes us further on our circle. One of Bolger's last endeavors in the musical theater was in the 1962 production All American, which produced the ballad Circle will now present Once Upon a Time. Rogers was an American original and a link to the original Americans. Born in Indian Territory in Oklahoma, the Cherokee Kid grew up to become one of the most versatile performers of all time. He was a rope trick artist, a vaudeville showman, a stand-up comedian, a cowboy philosopher, a political humorist, a syndicated columnist, an author, a radio commentator, and a movie star. At the peak of his career in 1934, he held the unique distinction of being American's top box office film attraction and most popular newspaper columns at the same time. He was the best known and best loved American in the world. 
Broadway's recent hit, Will Rogers Follies, tells the story of Will Rogers' life through a setting that the humorist himself was very familiar with, a Ziegfeld Follies type presentation. This is appropriate because for years, Rogers was a leading headliner in Ziegfeld's famous productions. One thing that keeps the, the Will Rogers Follies lighthearted is the acknowledgement at the beginning of the show that everyone knows what will happen in the end. Will Rogers and his friend Wiley Post will die in an airplane crash over Alaska. In fact, the actor portraying Mr. Post sits in the front row of the audience and frequently stands to invite Will to go flying with him, the invitation of which the actor playing Rogers obviously defers until the finale of the second act. We'll start our presentation of music from the Will Rogers Follies in a way similar to that of the show. For our Venner Follies, we'll begin by acknowledging the end. The American people faced a huge challenge in accepting and dealing with Will Rogers' tragic death in 1935. At the time, author and playwright Robert Sherwood said, the impact upon the people of America at the death of Will Rogers was similar to that produced by the death of Abraham Lincoln. The words of author and poet Carl Sandburg. There is a curious parallel between Will Rogers and Abraham Lincoln. Both were rare figures whom we could call beloved with ease and without embarrassment. A great tradition is that of Will Rogers. He ought to be taught in schools because of what he embodied of the best of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. He was as homely as a mud fence, yet as beautiful as a sunrise over an Oklahoma field of alfalfa. Another friend of Will Rogers was also a radio personality and said the following words about the humorous in a broadcast on the day of Rogers' funeral. I doubt if there is among us a more useful citizen than the one who holds the secret of banishing gloom, of making tears give way to laughter, of supplanting desolation and despair with hope and courage. For hope and courage always go with a light heart. There is something infectious about his humor. His appeal went straight to the heart of the nation. When he wanted to make a point for the good of all mankind, he was the kind of gentle irony that left no scars behind it. The American nation, to whose heart he brought gladness, will hold him in everlasting remembrance. That broadcaster was President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We let the words of O.O. McIntyre take us back to the follies and the life rather than the death of Will Rogers. I'd like to think of Will Rogers as flying on, freed of the cladish body. He must be ascending new heights, scaling new peaks. If Will Rogers were not one of the most talented men of his time, he could have achieved greatness for this simple statement. In a world swollen and angry red, I never met a man I didn't like.
You know, it bothers me that we're using up all our natural resources without replenishing them. We're just going along at top speed because we're using all ours up just as fast as we can. If we want to get something built out of wood, all I got to do is cut down a tree and build it. We didn't have to plant that tree. Nature did it before we came along. Now, suppose that if we wanted to build something out of wood, we had to find a tree, plant it, specifically for that use. Say, might never get built. You know, I don't really believe in the equality of women. I believe in their superiority. Unfortunately, I fear that the progress of civilization will eventually make the sexes equal. I'll bet you the time ain't far off when a woman won't know any more than a man. <laughs> I think that money and women are the two most sought after and least known about of any two things we have. And my advice to you gentlemen is this. If you let women have their way, You'll generally get even with them in the end. Well, Mr. Zigfield likes to end the first act with a wedding scene, so I best be about finding me a Mrs. Rogers. Here I sit, you need my 
Mr. Rogers, you've been invited to speak at the Republican Convention in Kansas City, and you've also been invited to speak at the Democratic Convention in Houston. Oh boy, the Democrats. They always have more fun at their conventions, because they know they ain't going anywhere afterwards. <laughs> Mr. Rogers, would you consider running for president? Well, this country's had pretty much everything named as presidential candidates, but we haven't quite sunk down to the professional actor stage yet. That's what I said back in 1928, folks. And another thing about politics, it breeds politics. It's what makes it so hard to stamp out. That's why you need to get right down there at the source. That's why I say we need birth control among politicians. <laughs> if you did run for president, what would your platform be? Oh, you know, the platform will always be the same. Promise everything, deliver nothing. And besides, when you're president, half the people think you're wrong all the time, and the other half think they could do a better job. Mr. Rogers, Alfalfa Bill Murray from the great state of Oklahoma has just placed your name into nomination for the Democratic presidential candidacy for 1932. Darn, must have done that when I was taking a nap. So, Mr. Rogers, are you going to run for president or not? I sure will. <laughs> This debunk party with some new ideas to vote. Don't ask me what my platform is, I leave that stuff alone. Cause no one keeps those promises as history has shown. I'll run a clean campaign and there will be my ready card. Considering the theory that will, that won't be too hard.
Democrats, Republicans, I'm asking for your vote. I've got this people party with some new ideas to vote. Don't ask him what his platform is, he leaves us all alone. Cause no one keeps those promises as history has shown. I'll run a clean campaign and that will be my winning card. Considering the kind we've had, well that won't be too hard. I met a whole lot of people in my lifetime, and I always try to approach them the same way my Indian ancestors would. You see, an Indian always looks back after he passes something, so he can get a view of it from both sides. A white man don't do that. He just figures that both sides of the thing are automatically the same. That's why you must never judge a man while you're facing him. You've got to go around behind him like an Indian, see what he's looking at. Then go around and face him, and you'll have a totally different idea who he is. You'd be surprised how much easier it is to get along with everybody. Dry the shoes on that are his. Feel what makes him what he is. What it's like inside his skin. Living in the skin he's in. Just like me, a lump of sod. There but for the grace of God. That is the philosophy of this part-time Cherokee. When I die, my epitaph, or whatever you call those signs on gravestones, it's gonna read, 
I joked about every prominent man of my time, but I never met a man I didn't like. I'm so proud of that statement, I can hardly wait to die, just so it can be carved. And when you come to my grave, you'll find me just sitting there, proudly reading it. Our theme song, Side by Side by Side, indicate to all of us that another dinner theater is coming to an end. Or, to use the politically correct vernacular of the day, it's time for closure. Our front line of seniors represents a total of 63 years of honor involvement. Hopefully, after this evening, you'll have an understanding of just how much learning accompanied those years of performing experience. Actually, working with a 60 some student cast teaches all of us more about cooperation, patience, commitment, and responsibility than it does about music or performing. And that's just fine. Our name better means friends, and as Will Rogers said, you gotta sort of give and take in this old world. We can get mighty rich, but if we haven't got any friends, we will find we are poorer than anybody. We thank you for sharing the wealth of your friendship and being with us tonight. On behalf of the cast and Mr. Spaulding, I would like to take this opportunity to issue to all of you friends a pledge that we will add the friendship you've offered to the life lessons we've learned and the talents we've endeavored to groom. That way, when we travel to Walt Disney World, we will do the best that we can to be positive and effective ambassadors for our school, our community, and our state. The road has not always been a smooth one for us, but the challenges we've faced have enabled us to learn more about ourselves and each other, and thus to grow. 
Though our tasks have been difficult, they might well have been impossible had we not been able to meet them side by side by side. Thank you.